you want to take your Bibles out and start turning to Romans chapter 8, we'll read it in just a moment, but if you want to start turning to there and have that ready for a little bit, we want to cover a few things before we get to that passage though. We're talking about being one degree off and how even though it seems like we're going in the right direction sometimes, if we're one degree off, the farther we go, the, the more devastating the, the differences can be. So on the, on the screen here, I have a, a map of what the, the path from JFK to LAX airports. So from New York to Los Angeles there, that, uh, that would be the route that you would take. And uh, I went on, online to this mapping, mapping uh, website, and uh, if you fly from uh, JFK to LAX um, bearing 2 degrees, 273.9, at 2,474 miles, you'll end up right at the Los Angeles airport, right at that spot, right where I have on the map there. So, if you're right on target, you'll end up right be. But what happens if you go one degree off? You end up in the ocean. Not a good thing. So one degree off, the farther you go, the more devastating the results can be. So we might seem like we're, we're on a right course in our lives, but if we're one degree off, the farther along we go, the more we could end up in the ocean where we don't want to be. We've picked up some ideas from our, our life and our culture that are, that are one degree off. And they sound right, but they're slightly off and we can end up way off course the more we walk with those ideas. So let's look at the screen and let's uh, go to our memory verse here. Let's say it together and then we'll take it away and see if we can say it without it there. Let's say it. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And take it away. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And uh, if you don't have a wristband yet, there's more in the back in a basket there. It says Romans 12, 2 on it, and it will help us remember to to uh, stay on God's course. And if they don't fit your wrist, do whatever you need. You can cut them apart, stick them to something, hang them somewhere. Just uh, use it so that you can remember what that verse says. The idea we're talking about today that's one degree off is, I am what I feel. I am what I feel. That it's a one degree off idea. Now it's pretty close because feelings are kind of a a big part of who we are and they can tell us a lot about who we are and what's going on with us. Nobody can tell you how to feel. If uh, you do try to tell people how to feel, they they don't really like that very much. And so there's there's a there's a lot that's that's pretty true there that our feelings are expressions of who we are. But it is a one degree off idea. We confuse what we feel with the truth. But what we feel doesn't always reflect what's real. So for example, we can feel hungry, but not need food necessarily. Um, We can... We can, our stomachs can tell us that we're hungry, but if they're, all, if they're all stretched out from eating a lot recently, we might not need any extra nutrition. We just might have an empty stomach. We can feel afraid, but that doesn't mean we're in danger. When, when we're young, and maybe you remember you used to be a little scared of the dark, it doesn't mean we were in danger, but we were afraid. And we can feel healthy and and well, but we might need medical attention regardless. Um, Just for fun, I I looked up a bunch of of, uh, famous last words, 
people who were famous and the last things that they said, and I found a bunch of them here. Um, maybe some of you might have heard of somebody called Pistol Pete. He was a basketball player, really good. And uh, there was one time he collapsed during a pickup game, and his last words were before that, I feel great. Um, there was another one, Douglas Fairbanks. He says he had a heart attack earlier that day. And later that day, he said, I've never felt better. Those are his last words. Or Andrew Jackson, the president of the United States a long time ago, um, he says, I need no doctor. And uh, those were his last words. Or one more, Rudy Valentino is a silent film actor from uh, 1926. He had a ruptured ulcer. His last words, I feel fine. We can feel a certain way, but that doesn't mean it's, it's real or what is actually going on. We can also have pain in arms and legs that we don't have. It's called phantom pain. We can feel pain if we have in a hand that maybe we don't have, that maybe was amputated or something like that. That doesn't mean it's real. Well, we often internalize what we feel, and it shapes our life, and it shapes our identity. We take the things that we feel, and we take them as like gospel truth, and it shapes who we are. If you're somebody who's sensitive, and I know at least some of you out there have, uh, have sensitivities, i probably kind of sensitive myself, this, this is your struggle. Because for some people, feelings hit you really hard. And they tend to shape who you are. They shape how you think. They shape how you live. If you have any mental illnesses, and I know some of you out there have this too, like depression or anxiety or, or bipolar disorders, anything like that, this is your struggle. Your struggle is to not let your feelings define who you are and to tell you who you are. But this isn't just for sensitive people with mental illnesses either. For all of us, if somebody asks you, how are you? One of the most common response from us is, I'm fine. When we're not feeling the best, we might say, I'm sick. We might say, I'm angry. We might say, I'm sad. You notice that we don't say, I feel sad, I feel angry, I feel sick. We say, I'm sick, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm happy. It's like this is who we are. These aren't just feelings, it's like we're claiming this as our identity almost. Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying that we can't talk like that, but, but what does that say about us? We internalize what we feel and we make it a part of who we are. Feelings, though, come from our minds and hearts, which the Bible says are, are tainted with sin. So, on the screen here, this is Jesus talking. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So we have, we have feelings, they come from within us, but these are tainted with sin. Let's look at Romans 8, our passage today. This is what needs to define who we are. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, 
but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. There's a lot going on in this passage that we could talk about, but let's just kind of focus on a little bit here. Now, we're talking about feelings and how they shape us. Not all feelings are bad, but we do need to test them for truth. Not everything that we feel inside is, is wrong or bad, but we do need to test them against what God has said to see if they're valid or not. If you look at what we read here in verse 6, it talks about how the mind of the flesh is death. And verse 7, the mind of the flesh is hostile to God. So not all of our feelings are, are good. Some of them are going to be hostile to God. They're going to want to go in other directions than God would have us go. But feelings aren't bad themselves, but here's a question for us. Do they define us? Do we live by them? Are they the ones calling the shots in how we act, what we say, what we do? Are our decisions geared to feeling good, good feelings, or are they geared to godliness, what God would have us do? What do we base our decisions on? Where do our thoughts follow? This passage talks about how there are two ways to live here. There's living by the flesh, and there's living by the Spirit. In verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There's a contrast there. Verse 9, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. Verse 10, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. There's, there's two ways that we can think and live and act. We can live according to the Spirit, or we can live according to our flesh. Just whatever comes from inside of us. In verse 14, it says, If you live by the Spirit, then you are sons of God. You are God's children. We can live by our feelings, just from whatever comes up within inside of us, or we can live by faith, by the Spirit. We can be defined by what we feel inside, whatever comes from within us, or we can be defined by faith. We can be defined by our Father. We can feel a certain way, but that doesn't mean that's who we are. So there might be some of you out there today who 
you might feel like you're a loser. Maybe you feel insignificant. Maybe you feel ugly or unattractive. That doesn't mean that's who you are. Just because you feel that way, or might feel that way, that doesn't mean you actually are a loser. That doesn't mean you actually are insignificant, or you actually are unattractive. In our, in our culture today, we have men who say, you know, I feel like I'm a woman. And we have people out there who say, I'm gay. That doesn't mean that's who you are. That's how you feel. But that doesn't mean that's your identity. We have people who think that they're the greatest person in the world. That doesn't mean that's, that's true. Verse 1. It says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's none. There's no condemnation. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are set free from sin. There is no condemnation for you. And that is true whether you feel it or not. That's the truth that we need to live by, that we need to think by, no matter what we might feel. Now, all of us have been insulted and offended and hurt by some things people have said. That, that's just universal to all of us. We've all been hurt and insulted, right? And that, that hurts when that happens. It makes us feel bad. Somebody says to us, you know, you're ugly, you're a loser. That kind of hurts. It gives us bad feelings inside. And when we have those bad feelings, we tend to want to fight back. Well, you're a loser. You're ugly. We want to fight back. Maybe we want to hit them or something like that even. We, we want to fight back because when we have those bad feelings, that, that shapes our, our behavior. But that comes from an assumption that I am what I feel. If somebody says something mean to us and we feel bad about that and we want to fight back, that's because we've internalized what they've, what they've made us feel. We've actually believed that we might be ugly or a loser. We want to fight back because we've internalized that. We've said that that is who I am. So if you have this idea, if, I'm going to assume that most of us think this way. If, if it's true that I am what I feel, then when somebody makes us feel bad, we're going to want to fight back. We're going to want to hurt them back. But if it's the case that I am in Christ, if I'm in Christ, then it will hurt. But that's not who I am. I don't need to fight back. Jesus wasn't just insulted. I mean, he was insulted, but he wasn't just insulted. He was blasphemed. And it didn't define him. That wasn't who he was. And he didn't fight back. 1 Peter 2, 22 and 23, He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He didn't internalize it. That wasn't who he was. He wasn't defined by what he was feeling. In Christ, insults still hurt, but those feelings don't define us or our actions. If we belong to Christ then at least in theory, people should be able to insult us, mock us, cuss us out, tell us all kinds of terrible things about ourselves and our family, and we should be, that will hurt, but it won't define our response. It won't change how we think about ourselves. 
when people insult us, when they hurt us, when they say mean things to us, don't let that define who you are. You will have bad feelings, but don't let those bad feelings define, shape how you respond. That's not who you are. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. This is a good one too. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. By the spirit, we don't obey feelings of fear. Fear is something that controls us. It keeps us from doing the things that we should do and it makes us do things that we shouldn't do. Fear is a a controlling feeling. But by the Spirit, we are free from that. Looking to Jesus as our example again. At Gethsemane, Jesus felt fear, but He was defined by Abba, Father. In Mark, chapter 14, it says, Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. He was afraid, but he wasn't defined by those feelings. He was defined by Abba, Father. And because he was defined by Abba Father, he prayed, yet not as I will, but as you will. If we're defined by our Father, if that's who we are, then we can overcome fear. Fears won't define us. They won't dictate what we do or how we think. We might feel afraid of danger, of pain, or the future, but in Christ, that doesn't define us. That's not who we are. We are not people of fear. We are people of Christ. We are children of God. That's who we are. So maybe you have a surgery, and maybe you're a little anxious about that. You're going to do it anyways because it's the right thing to do. I remember... A little bit ago, um, some, some of us are afraid of, of needles and such. Uh, I remember a few months ago uh, giving blood at uh, Courtney Pruitt's uh, blood drive, or Courtney Kaler's blood drive, and, uh, and I don't like needles at all. And, and I thought, well, I don't like needles, but I'll just do it and I'll get it over with and everything. But when I got there, I was really anxious about it. I was like trembling. The, the woman who took my blood, actually had to rub alcohol in my arm, and she said, okay, smell this. And so I did, and then before you know it, it was over. And that actually worked pretty well. But it was just surprising at how nervous I was. I was, I was actually trembling because of this. And it's like, I've done this before, what's wrong with me? But don't be defined by your fear. Do it anyways. Maybe you have to face somebody who hurts you. You're going to do it anyways, even though you're afraid. Maybe you are afraid of losing your job. And maybe you're asked to do something that's wrong. But you're going to stand up anyways because you're not afraid. Maybe you have some opportunities to share your faith. And you're a little afraid about what you're going to say But you're going to do it anyways because it's the right thing to do because the fear inside you is not going to define you. It's not going to dictate who you are. It's not going to dictate how you act and how you live. Verse 16, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. If you live by the Spirit, then there's a testimony there that you are a child of God. You can call God your Father. Not just God, not just Lord. You can call Him Father. It means you have a special relationship there. You belong to Him, body and soul, in life and in death. You know how huge that is? He's your Father. 
Just like Jesus. No matter what we feel, in Christ, God is our Father. That's who we are. You might feel like you're a sinner. Maybe you feel like you're a loser. Maybe you feel ugly. Maybe you feel unintelligent or worthless, weird or awkward. Whatever you feel, that's not who you are. You are a child of God. God is your Father. That's who you are. That's how you're going to live. That's what you're going to do. That's how you're going to think. That's what defines you. Don't let others define you. People around us will try to define us. They'll try to tell us who we are and make us feel that way so that we will act in ways that they want us to act. That's just kind of human nature. Don't let that happen. Be defined by what God says you are. And by His Spirit, He says, you are God's children. Look at the screen here with me and let's answer the question together. Why is He called, that's Jesus, called God's only Son when we, are also, we also are God's children? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural Son of God. We, however, are adopted children of God. Adopted by grace through Christ. And one more. Why do you call him, that is Jesus Christ, our Lord? Because not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, he has set us free from sin and from the tyranny of the devil and has bought us body and soul to be his very own. Again, we belong to him. That's who we are. So be defined by Christ, who literally went through hell to be with us. It says in the Apostles' Creed, He descended to hell. He went through hell so we could belong to Him, so that we could be children of God. Don't let other people define who you are. Don't let your feelings define who you are. Be defined by this. This is who you are. He fought fear, pain, abandonment, insult, helplessness, and He overcame those feelings. He overcame them. Live how He lived. He's our example. Live how He still lives, for that matter. Be defined by the Father who loves us enough to give His only Son. Be defined by, you are a child of God. God is your Father. And He stops at nothing to cleanse us from sin, like verse 3 talks about there. What the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. He gave His Son so that we could belong to Him, so that we could be adopted. Adoptions are really expensive, same is true for God the Father. Adopting us as His children cost Him the death of His Son. You're going to feel a lot of things today, this week, in your lives. Don't let those define you. Be defined by what you know to be true. By this. Let's live by faith, not feelings. In Habakkuk 2.4, it's one of the most quoted verses of the New Testament. It says this, See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Desires might not be upright, but we will live by faith, by the Spirit, the Spirit who testifies that we are God's children. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, it's such a privilege to call you that, to, to be your children, and at a great cost that we recognize today. Lord, we pray that you would define us, and that you would be where we get our identity, and that, Lord, whatever we feel, whatever people say to us, whatever is going through our minds, Lord, let those things not define us. Lord, please be the one to define us. Lord, that's who we are. In Jesus' name.
Amen.